Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a really powerful small form factor PC that I've been wanting to get my hands on for a while. Now, as you can see here, this is an Intel NUC. It's powered by an i7 CPU, and this was formerly known as the Phantom Canyon. One of the big reasons I'm actually taking a look at this now is because I've seen price drops on these all over the place. I'll leave a couple links in the description. Another reason I wanted to take a look at this was obviously the form factor. If you watch the channel, you know I love my mini PCs, but I would definitely consider this a true mini gaming PC, given the specs we have here. Now, we've seen a very similar design from Intel in the past, and with that PC, when it came out, it actually performed really well, but it was loud and it did get hot. With the new Phantom Canyon, I think they fixed all that and they've definitely increased performance. So inside of the box, we're obviously going to get the NUC itself. We got this little pullout drawer with some accessories. We've got our power cable and the power brick or the PSU. I believe this is a 230 watt power brick. So yeah, I mean, as you can see, the power brick is pretty big when you consider uh, these mini PCs, but it's necessary. I mean, if they would have packed this inside of the PC itself, it would have made it a lot larger. We've also got our stand, so this can set vertically or horizontally. And we've got a VESA mounting bracket along with some hardware. I've always loved the design of these Enthusiast NUCs. I think they look really good. Super small form factor. We've got a lot of I.O. on this. And if you're into it, we do have that lighted Intel skull up top here. And we can change the color of this in software to basically any color in the book. Checking out the I.O. From the left to the right up front here, we've got a full-size SD card reader. Thunderbolt 4 port, two USB 3.0 ports, and these are USB 3.2, and we also have a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. Moving around back, we've got an optical audio port, 2.5 gigabit ethernet port, four more USB 3.0 Gen 2 ports. We also have another Thunderbolt 4 port back here, full-size HDMI, mini display port, and our power in. So when it comes to IO on these mini PCs, we're pretty much loaded down. Real quick, let's take a look inside of the unit. It's actually really easy to get this top plate off. We've got two M.2 NVMe slots here. It'll support up to two 80 millimeter drives. And we've got SODIMM RAM. This one came fully configured from the factory with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a single 512 gigabyte NVMe. But this unit does support up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. And as you can see, it's really easy to upgrade the storage with those two slots. Okay, so we've got a great form factor here coming in really small. We've got lots of I.O., a little bit of upgradability, but what about the main specs, the specs that are really going to get us into gaming? Well, for the CPU, we've got the i7-1165G7. Might not sound like a lot on paper. I've done a lot of testing with this. I'm a big fan of it. It's a Tiger Lake CPU with four cores and eight threads. It's got a base clock of 2.8 gigahertz and a turbo of 4.7. Now, right out of the box in normal mode, this is running at 30 watts. It'll do a boost up to around 45, I believe. But you can set this up to 65 watts and get the maximum performance out of this little chip. Like I mentioned, this one came pre-configured with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 running at 3200 megahertz, but the main claim to fame to the Phantom Canyon is the GPU. We've got an NVIDIA RTX 2060 with 6 gigabytes of VRAM. And whatever Intel did with the cooling system in this, it does a great job. The older enthusiast nooks got really loud and hot. This thing stays nice and quiet and really cool, even at those higher TDPs on the CPU and the GPU. I've been really impressed by the cooling system on this, given, you know, the form factor of this and what kind of performance this thing can really put out. Okay, so I've got everything up and running. This originally came pre-installed with Windows 10, but I just upgraded to Windows 11. Everything's been working really well so far. I've installed a bunch of games, some benchmarks. We'll test some emulators on this. I'll also give you a quick look at the BIOS, but Intel does have their own proprietary application for these uh, enthusiast NUCs that kind of allow us to change the performance profile. And from here, we can actually change the color of the skull on the front. It's also got some settings for the fan curve and things like that. But we can do this all from within the BIOS if you want to do it that way. This is just really easy to get into. Before I connect this to my game capture and take a closer look at everything, I did want to throw one game at it just to show you what it can do. We're going to go with Forza Horizon 5 running at 1440p high settings. And really impressed with the performance here. So initially I went into this at 1440p ultra settings and we had an average of around 55 FPS. That's with no resolution scale. 
If I turn resolution scale to quality with the ultra settings, then we can get an average of around 68, but I wanted to keep it at a true 1440p resolution, so here it is running at 1440p high, no resolution scale, and we can get an average of around 84 FPS at a Forza Horizon 5. And I will mention, if you don't mind playing this game at 30 FPS, we can go up to ultra settings 4K, lock it at 30, and have a really enjoyable experience. I like running at 60 or over, so 1440p high settings is really going to be the way to go. Okay, so real quick, wanted to give you a look at the BIOS. I've always been a big fan of these NUC BIOSes. We've got our advanced section. We can mess around with the storage, USB, video. We've got cooling. From here, we can actually set up our own fan curve. Or we can go to quiet, cool, custom, fixed, fanless. I'm set to balanced here. It does really well at balanced, and it doesn't get loud at all. Performance. Security. Power. This is the main section I always mess around with. So we've got uh, balanced enabled. This is something I'm going to turn off. I'm set to custom and I'm going to set this to 45 and we're going to leave the power limit to at 60, but we want to take that power window time up to 128. And yeah, that's all I'm really going to change here. Once I get into windows, we can take a look at the proprietary NUC application and we can actually set the performance mode to what we have set in the BIOS, or we could still go to low power or balanced from there. But really this is about all I change. Go ahead and save it. We'll boot into Windows 11. Before we jump into some benchmarks, more PC game testing and emulation, I just want to give you a look at the settings I'm using here. Um, it's been really smooth, like I mentioned. From the Intel Nook Software Studio, if we head over here to our little performance section, we've got low power mode. It's going to run that CPU at 25 watts. Balance 30. Max performance is only 34, but custom is what I have set in the BIOS. 45 watts on power level 1. 60 watts power level 2, and we've got a 128 second turbo boost time. We can set this to quiet, balanced, cool. I'm going to leave it at balanced here, and uh, I've done some testing so far, and given the form factor of this unit, it's an absolute beast. So the first thing we're going to take a look at are a few benchmarks. Here we have Geekbench 5, single core, 1340, multi, 4338. So with the multi, remember, we only have four cores and eight threads here. It'd be much higher if this was an eight-core part. Next up, we've got Cinebench R23. We got a total multi-core score of 5,792. Not super impressive given what we have on the market right now, but it is coming ahead of this at 28 watts, and I really thought it would given that we're running this much higher than 28 watts. The most impressive part here are actually the temperatures. This is a 10 minute test. It stresses out that CPU quite a bit, four cores, eight threads, and we only hit 75 degrees Celsius. And this thing is still really, really quiet. For a PC with this form factor, the cooling system they chose here is really good. Moving over to some GPU benchmarks. Here we have 3D Mark Night Raid. We got a total score here of 37,142. Fire Strike, 14,461. And finally, Time Spy with a 6,264. As a lot of you already know, I test a lot of mini PCs on my channel, and I've never had these scores out of a PC this size until now. In my opinion, these are some very impressive scores, but these are synthetic benchmarks, and now it's time to move back over to some real-world gaming. Alright, so jumping right into The Witcher 3, we're at 1440p ultra settings with no hair works on. Personally, not a huge fan of it. I think it does look pretty decent, but it kills performance, especially on the 2060. At 1440p ultra settings, we can get an average of 84 FPS with this game. Not bad at all. Perfectly playable here. I knew that this system was going to handle GTA pretty well, but I wasn't sure about 4K. It's been a while since I've tested the 2060 with this game. There's been a lot of updates since then when it comes to the driver side of things and the game itself. But here it is at 4K, very high settings, we got an average of 91 FPS. Running this at 4K on a small PC like this is really impressive. When it comes to something like Cyberpunk 2077, this is a game you'll definitely want to run at 1080p on this machine, but I still wanted to see what it would do at 1440p. We've got DLSS set to performance, and we can get an average of around 61 FPS. And at 1080p medium settings with no DLSS, we can get an average of around 64. I'd say your best bet would be, you know, 1080p turn DLSS to high quality, and you'll be good to go with this one.
When it comes to Elden Ring, in order to get a nice steady 60 out of it, maybe a couple dips down to 58, 1080p medium is the way to go. Now if you don't mind playing this at around 40 FPS, you can go to 1440p, or medium settings, 4K, lock it at 30. Unfortunately, it just won't do this at maximum settings, 1080p at a constant 60. And the final PC game we're going to test here is God of War, where at 1080p, high settings, no DLSS. We're getting an average of around 68 FPS. I was actually hoping for a little more out of this, and with DLSS, it's totally possible. 1440p, high settings, DLSS set to quality, we can lock it at 60 and have a good experience. We actually only get an average of around 63 FPS like that. And with DLSS set to quality, it really doesn't take that much away from the game. It's still fully playable and looks great. Now it's time to check out some emulation, and the first one we have here is GameCube using the Dolphin emulator. We are maxed out here using the OpenGL backend. You can go with DirectX 11 or Vulkan if you want to, but since we have an NVIDIA GPU, we can do this at 5K OpenGL, and it's going to run everything that's compatible with this emulator, no problem at all. Moving over to PS2 using PC SX2, we have Shadow of the Colossus 4K OpenGL, and if you've ever tried to emulate this game, you know that this little section here looking back at the cathedral really kills that GPU, but the 2060 can handle it at 4K. And finally, we've got some PS3. So we've only got four cores and eight threads, and if you know anything about the RPCS3 emulator, you know that there are some games that really love those cores and threads. Tekken 6 here isn't a super hard game to emulate. We can actually take this up to 1440p. I didn't try 4K, but I'm pretty sure it would handle it, seeing that we're only using around 30% of that GPU. But when moving over to a game that really utilizes more cores than threads, you might run into some issues. Here's Skate 3, and while we're right there on the cusp, you can see that we've maxed out this CPU up in the top left-hand corner with Afterburner, and we can only get a max clock of 4.1 GHz on all four cores. Now it's doing a decent job, but there are some dips here and there, and we're only at 1080p. Overall, I'm very impressed with the Phantom Canyon, basically everything that this thing has to offer. Form factor is perfect. I mean, we've got a super small mini PC here. Performance is great, given how small this thing is. Even with this running at 45 watts up to 60 under boost, with all four cores, eight threads, and the RTX 2060 maxed out, it doesn't get loud. I figured that this was going to sound like a jet engine, like the original Ghost Canyon, which basically had the same design, but a much different GPU and CPU combination. But that's definitely not the case with the Phantom Canyon, and the highest temperatures I saw out of this through all of my testing and benchmarks was 76 degrees Celsius on a single core. The next highest one was 75, so whatever they chose to use in this, does work out well for this Tiger Lake CPU, paired up with that RTX 2060. So yeah, performance is great. It's an awesome little mini PC. It's got a lot more power than basically anything else in its form factor right now. And if you're interested in learning more, I will leave a couple links in the description. They can get quite expensive, but since the original release, the price has dropped a bunch, and that's really one of the main reasons I wanted to pick it up. And I might do at least one more video with the Phantom Canyon, so if there's anything else you want to see running on this, be it an operating system, more games, or more emulators, let me know in the comments below. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. Like always... Thanks for watching.